Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Paul Manzone, he went into the hospital during the COVID epidemic of 2020, and he was placed in a coma. For four months, he was in the hospital, and he had an amazing encounter at the point of death where he was saying his last goodbyes to his wife, and the hand of God reached down to him and saved him. We're going to be talking about this amazing encounter that uh, the point of death. And Paul, we want to welcome you to our, our program and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Randy. I very much appreciate this opportunity. Well, likewise, Paul, for sharing this, because many lives, of course, have been touched by uh, COVID, especially with the Delta variant in 2020. Uh, there were many, many deaths, um, thousands of deaths uh, caused just in the United States and across the world, hundreds of thousands of deaths caused by this. But uh, going into this, your your wife had developed uh, COVID, but prior to even you contracting this uh, variant, uh, you were church attenders, uh, ushering in church and so tell us about uh, where you were spiritually uh, before before the epidemic uh, hit you. Well, um, we went to a church in Southern California, and um, we served. We greeted at the door. Um, we did the donuts, and we picked them up and did all that. And uh, we helped set up the tables and handed out the brochures for the day <sighs> we my whole life i've been connected with jesus i've had lots of experiences this particular church was amazing to us because my wife and i had been um searching for somewhere to get married and because we weren't members of a church at the time nobody wanted to marry us and we just went to this church and a gentleman walked up and said, hello, my name is John. And I said, hello and welcome. Okay, great. Thank you. And then we sat down and next thing we know, he's up there giving the sermon. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, the pastor just came and said hello to us. And that, to <laughs> me, that was so unique that it just meant a lot. And that's so we pursued that church. It was a distance from our house, but well worth it. Yes. Well, the, the reason I asked that question of many of our guests, Paul, is because the uh, after death or near death experience is somewhat determinant on one's relationship with the Lord going into it. We've had guests who have gone on to hell and some, many of to heaven. Uh, and um, that positioning uh, as, as a believer really determines to a large extent what happens. So you now, as you're uh, a married couple, obviously, and then your wife contracts COVID. Now, this is the most virulent form of COVID during that time, as many of us will recall. Yes. And your wife initially caught that uh, that virus. She did. And it was just before Christmas. It was December 20th, I think, when she got it. And, um, you know, the whole time, I just didn't think her or I were going to get COVID. I just, I've always just trusted everything's going to be okay. I've always had that, you know, feeling within me. And when she got it, she was in the hospital four full days. She had the plasma, the remdesivir, antibiotics, and the hospital was getting so crowded that they just, you know, you go home. And she still had high fevers, 102, 103. And she was really worried about me. And we were, we were, um, monitoring my oxygen my blood oxygen levels with the pulse oximeter and hers and hers her oxygen did good but she still retained super high fevers mm -hmm. and december she came home christmas eve 
And to me, that was a blessing because I had my wife for, for Christmas and she was home. Mm. And it was a very scary time because, as you know, people were just dying all over the place. And it was so chaotic that they didn't have any form of fixing this. Um, it, it was before the, the vaccine. It was before they had any clue on exactly what was going on. And she she's very strong and she was able to come home and um that was christmas eve and then december 29th i woke up in the morning and i couldn't stand up to go to the restroom and we had to call 911 and i went into the hospital mm. and that was yeah yeah that was little did you know that you wouldn't be coming out of that hospital for a long period of time because Apparently, the strain that you had or how it affected you personally was much more uh, severe. So uh, when you went into the hospital and, and uh, obviously you had COVID uh, diagnosed with that, uh, you were isolated as patients were at that time, not knowing the, how contagious or how to you know, contain uh, the spread of the disease. And uh, what did the doctors tell you in, at that point? I mean, what, what was going through your mind? What was happening? Well, see, that, that's the thing is, you know, even though I was watching people die, um, and then I went into, you know, I was in the IU, emergency room, ER, and then ICU um, for full days. And I just thought, I'm going to be okay. Uh, this isn't so bad. You know, I don't know what everybody's, even though I knew I was very, very sick, but I've always, always, always just trusted that everything will be okay. And it just didn't cross my mind that I could die. Mm. And um, then they did what you said. They put me into isolation and I was down in the basement basically. And um, the doctor just said, I don't know what else to do. I, I, I've, done, I've done everything I can do. What, what do you think? And I said, well, what would be the next step? And he said, we need to put you on life support. And I said, well, let's do it. Mm. I Again, I don't think I processed what all this meant as far as how far gone I was or how close I was to being gone um so when they put me you know under i just thought this was just a natural course of action that that's just what i was supposed to do and uh that's when everything started to come into a very spiritual sphere for me mm. well now they intubated you Mm -hmm. And there are some patients that didn't come off intubation. Sometimes pneumonia can be developed uh, with an intubated patient who's on intubation. For those of you who don't know what intubation is, it's basically uh, putting down a, a tube or a cannula through the mouth to actually do the breathing through a machine for, uh, for the patient. And, and that had happened to you, but the doctors had to put you in a coma as as a result of this didn't they yes and um i i was under for six days the first time um this that happened to me twice the very first time i was in my where i was was something that I just can't put into words. Um, I, I, I saw, I, I don't claim to say that I saw Jesus or that I talked with Jesus, but I know he was there. Mm. And um, this is, this, this is what I saw. And the, these are the, the hands that I saw. And I was laying inside those hands mm. and it was dark around me, but not right there. And what I felt was this overwhelming 
sense of peace. Like I did not want to leave, to be honest. I was really happy right there. I was good to go. And I think there was more for me to experience. So uh, then I woke up. And when I woke up, the doctor looked at me and he said, oh, you're back with us. <laughs> I, I <laughs> they didn't expect you to survive. Exactly. No. Exactly. Wow. Now, when you held up those those hands, the, and I understand we were talking about this earlier, that uh, your wife gave that to you as a Christmas present. There is literally, when, when you were in the hands of God, they you you describe it as as literally golden hands that were reaching yes. down to you yes and that's exactly right it for lack of better terms you're probably a little closer to my age the the all state hands that were in the commercials these were <laughs> golden hands and i was just laying in them and and they were the most beautiful things i've ever seen and I didn't understand it when I was there, like how I got there, why I was there. I just really didn't want to go. I was really happy there. Mm. Yeah. You're in the hands of God. And so you were now comparatively speaking, we have, have talked about the magnitude, the size of God almighty, but your body, your entire body, was literally in a like a, a mini mode, if you will, yeah. uh, in the hands of God. I mean, that's how how big, how powerful He is. And that's exactly how it felt. That's exactly how it felt. I just felt like I was, I was, if I could, if I could put into words what I experienced, and just give everybody that my life would be complete mm. that's that's just how i feel i just i want i want people to know what that was and that there is so much more than than what's here you know and i don't think people nowadays appreciate or grasp the reality of god mm -hmm. and i think it's a, a lost era Mm -hmm. And um, it makes me sad, obviously. But yeah, it was very powerful, Randy. It was very, very, very powerful. And from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but you weren't uh, an extraordinarily supernatural believer at the time. I mean, if somebody, I'll give you, give, ask you a question. So before this experience, if somebody told you that you would be in the golden hands of God, mm -hmm you probably I'm guessing would not have really been too accepting of that. I don't think I would have uh, envisioned what I did go through. Mm -hmm. um, I've always believed that God has carried me the old uh, poem, uh, footprints in the sand. Um, for me, I've had so many experiences where God has carried me literally carried me and my life from ultimate demise to I'm here and I'm alive and I'm doing great. Mm. So when this happened, um, yeah, I can't say that I would have imagined that I saw God or saw the hands. I, I just. <sighs> yeah. It wasn't something that you would ever, ever contrive. Now did, did the Lord um, communicate with you at all, or would, was it a, just a sense of being taken care of? It was, it was a sense. Um, he didn't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it into words, Randy. I just, I was there, and there wasn't verbal communication by any means, but there was something going on this way. And um, he just told me without words, everything was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when I came back. 
And you were, did come back. The doctors were surprised that you did make it back. I mean, that was miraculous in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But your battle was not over, was it? I mean, you were, you were not going to be discharged. You were not, you thought you were maybe on the road of recovery, hopefully, but that didn't happen. No, as a matter of fact, I had I had to go to a, a rehab, physical rehab, because while I was under my whole upper body strength, I lost everything. Um, I couldn't even pick up a remote for the TV in the hospital. So I had to go through a rehab. And when I was there, I was two days from coming home. I was there 35 days or more. And I was two days from coming home. Now, also, at the same time, you got to understand, my wife was still having 103 plus temperatures that whole first 30 to 40 days I was in the hospital. And I couldn't be with her. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do anything to help her. And that was really hard. That was, you know, that was probably one of the harder things for me was not being able to help her the way that I wanted to. Hmm. So two days before I was to come home, um, I they weren't letting anybody in the hospital to see their family members. Uh, the doctor I was working with was amazing. He called my wife every single day, which, you know, they were super busy at that time. And for him to do that was in itself a godsend mm. well there there wasn't going to be a discharge for you then um because that that um you were going to have a second event uh that would happen that would extend your hospital stay to a total of about four months yes um i i had been recovering um, and I kept thinking, well, I'm going to make it. I'm going to go home. Well, I just went downhill very fast. And um, my lungs were filling with liquid. And the doctor called my wife and said, you need to come down and say goodbye. He, he's not going to make it through the night. <clears throat> and um, we, we got to spend about two two, maybe three hours together, which why I was chosen for that out of everybody else around me that was dying or couldn't see their family members. And God made it possible for me to see mine, to see my wife, to say goodbye in my lungs. Filled up with so much liquid that I literally just laid down and said goodbye. <laughs> I was going. I was on my way. I don't think I was going to come back. Then I saw I was under another eight days. <clears throat> this time I was laying on my back. Uh, looking towards my feet in my mind. Same two hands, scooping liquid out of my lungs. I could see it happening. I mean, I could see the hands. I could, I could see it right now. I came back out of that. And again, the doctor is very surprised. I, I had to get a tracheotomy as well. They did not think I was going to make it. They just, it just was not even there. And I did. And I remember... There was one doctor, um, she was the hospitalist, and I had had a very uh, traumatic, uh, you know, 
hospital experience. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm dying right now. I'm having a heart attack. I'm dying. It, it's, you know, I've been through all that, but this was even more scary to me because I didn't have those hands to comfort me in front of me. I, I, both my parents, my grandparents have all died from heart disease. I had a double bypass at 41 and I've had five stents since. This event was extremely scary to me. And I, I just looked up and there was that doctor and she, she grabbed my hand and just said, you're gonna be okay. And it was like an angel talking to me. I don't know, I'm not saying that an angel possessed her, but that's what it felt like to me. And I mean, there's just so many things that happened that I know I was in the presence of God. I know it. Mm. Well, the fact that he was literally with his hands scooping out the fluids from you. And I think that's, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, a dynamic that and a revelation to us as to what God does literally reaching in with his hand and saving your lungs, because all indications were with your history of heart disease and with uh, the COVID being more severe. I know a lot of people with uh, pre-existing conditions such as yourself, of course, that, that led to the probability of death yes. uh, at that severity. And, and mm -hmm. so he was with you, saving you at that time, saving yes. you from all of this. And what was the, you had said your goodbyes to your wife. What was the prognosis then? Were you in the coma? Uh, were the doctors bringing you out of the coma? How long were you in the yes. coma at that second second kind of phase? Eight, eight days. Mm. Eight days. And I had got, I was able to say my goodbyes. In fact, I had written a letter to my wife for some reason just because I saw so much death around me, people that were younger than me, um, nurses, people just getting so sick and passing away that I thought I better put my thoughts on paper. So if I don't make it, I, my wife has, has this. Hmm. So I was able to do that, and I, uh, I, I still don't know why. He, he he allowed me that privilege. Well, one of the reasons is you're speaking with us today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Many people are are gaining encouragement from you that the Lord doesn't abandon us in the time of greatest need. And I firmly, wholeheartedly, one hundred percent believe that. Yeah. At what point did you come out of the proverbial woods? And what time? I mean, here you are, kind of the up and down. You thought you were recovering. You couldn't walk. You had to rehab to learn how to function again. And uh, we see that you have a, um, uh, oxygen now that you're inhaling. So obviously there was some effect of the COVID and your physical health uh, today. But at what point during your hospital stay did you know, was there any confirmation from the Lord that he was, you're going to be okay? You had some, whether it be a kind of an angelic, uh, um, you know, type I, nurse I, or whatever, but by your bedside, you don't know. But um, at what point did you have that assurance that you were going to survive? I had been, I went to five different hospitals in that four month period because of so much tra tra trauma I was going through. Um, when I had the tracheotomy, I had to be sent to a different hospital because they specialized in stuff like that. Uh, so I was in that hospital another month and a half. And it was during that period where my tube had actually popped out and I was I was like in a pet carrier type of bedroom. They were so packed. 
And all we had was curtains between us. And I was panicking because I, mean, I couldn't breathe. It was at that time, at my lowest point, being aware that I knew, even though I was having this happen, that I was going to be okay. And I don't, it just, it just was a feeling of you're going to be okay. You're going to make it through this. And I never, again, I never believed in my heart that I was going to die. And I think that was a big part of it is I just didn't give it the credo or the credo. What's the word? I can't say that's the part. Um, I didn't give it that credence. Yeah. I think. Thank you. Um, so it was right around then that I, I realized I was probably going to be okay. Um, I was very fortunate. My my thighs, after the second time, I had lost 75 pounds. Um, my thighs were about that big around. Um, my whole body was, you know, I had a feeding tube in my stomach. <sighs> I had to learn how to talk again, how to walk again, how to stand up, how to take care of myself, how to shower, how to eat, how to swallow. Everything was gone. It was just gone. Mm -hmm. And I had good people around me that it was a it was a um, Christian uh, hospital. It's called Providence uh, in California. And before it was St. Joe and St. Joseph's. And um, so I was very fortunate all the way through. I mean, I just, everything that was supposed to happen, happened. Yeah, I'm, I'm well familiar with those hospitals. I, I did a little bit of work there in the cardiovascular side with those hospitals. And I met some people of, of uh, faith, Christian faith in those hospitals. So you were surrounded. Um, the... The golden hands, back to those, Paul, because uh, there's significance in all of the supernatural events. Why do you think, looking back, these were the golden hands as opposed to hands that you or you and I might have? Is there any significance to you now looking back on that? Why? Mean, being gold or... Yeah, or just, the, just the appearance of those hands being specifically and that golden appearance. I think it was, to me, illuminating the presence of God. Um, for me, it was uh, not only were they hands, but they were, you know, they were gold and they were, they were something that, that my, my uh, being just went to. And I knew that those hands were special. I knew that it wasn't just regular hands. Yeah, I'm looking for the uh, verse now, you're more precious than gold or silver. Anyway, they, um, and I, I won't spend time looking now, but there is a significance to everything that God does, isn't it? I mean, you, you were saved for a purpose. And uh, that's one thing about those we've talked about in the past who go on to heaven, who are believers in Jesus Christ, is that their purposes have been fulfilled and they're complete. That purpose doesn't end necessarily in heaven, but it continues on in a more exponential way in heaven, in a more glorious way. But there's a purpose specifically designed in this world and you're fulfilling that purpose uh, and have fulfilled and doing it now before the audience. So. What tell us what happened then? You went through rehab, and you were on what you thought would be your road to recovery, but you had been there before. Did it go through your mind that maybe you yeah. were going to fall into another uh, crisis moment? Yeah, it did. Um, when, when you know, I I had wanted to go home so bad that I was willing to you know, trudge through it, so to speak. And then um, I knew that that's, I think, what prompted me to write the letter to my wife was that 
I was starting to believe that there was a, a more uh, tragic ending to all of this. And so I think that's what prompted me to write the letter to my wife. And it was then that I realized I'm not out of the woods. I'm not out of the woods. And, and like, even even then you were expecting you wrote that letter, which was a, a goodbye letter to your wife that essentially. Yeah, it was uh, probably three pages long. Um, I just wanted her to know how much I loved her, that God would take care of her if I was to go. I had a lot of people praying for me. I just wanted her to know that there's more than here. And that's why I wanted this as well. I want people to understand that there's so much more than than what we can even gather and hear. There was at this point a peace in in that the Lord might take you to heaven, or was there a sense that there was more to be done? Where were you at in terms of your own kind of coming to? Obviously, we're we're saying goodbye at this point, but you were prepared to go or you felt like God had something more? Uh, I was prepared. Um, but in my understanding, so many things had been happening that led me to believe there might be more. But I was perfectly content to go. Mm. Um, my body had been through so much I had lost so much, um, and my wife had been through so much. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't stand to see her suffer. Mm -hmm. So that was the hardest part. But I knew, I knew as I came out of the second time around, I knew there was a bigger calling for me. I knew there was something I needed to do. And, and what is what is that calling that you feel today why you were saved by the Lord, obviously in a miraculous way? You know, I reach out to people that I never did before about Jesus, uh, family. Um, that I know I've planted the seed, but I don't know that it's going to grow. I know that I've reached out to lots of people. I believe that somewhere my story needed to be told. Um, but the biggest thing for me is I know that my I need to be here for my wife. I need to be here to speak for Jesus. Um, I need to share what happened to me because if I can just give one person, just one person, that much hope that there's something better, mm -hmm. wow. then everything I went through is worth it. Mm -hmm. Just think of that, uh, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, what Paul just said, that if he can, if he his story can impact just one person, then it was all worth it. And that person is you. That person is you. And uh, and Paul, uh, I just feel led now, and I'm, I'm gonna invite you to pray for our audience in a bit, but just to um, encourage anyone at this point who doesn't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, just what encouragement would you have for that person who's kind of saying, well, I'm not sure. I don't know if he even exists. What would you say to that person? Uh, uh, my biggest thing is why why are you fighting it? I mean, there's 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 so much that you don't know that you can know and that you can feel. And there's a hope beyond hope that there's there's a better purpose 
than what we are doing in this world right now. And I don't mean you or I, I just mean the chaos that's in the world right now. It needs to be refocused. It needs to be churned back to God. And I and I want so bad that people understand that there is more, that it's not just words. It's not just words. If I could, if I could just have one person feel what I feel, then I did what I was supposed to do. Man. I, hope, I hope I answered that right. You did. And if you are watching this and you are that one person, and that's how God sees you as the most important person, as the only one in the world. That's really how he sees you, not as, as one in a mass of people. He sees you as, a, as one, as the most important one. Then um, if you don't know him, and if you're not sure, just pray. Pray. Just confess that, that you've fallen, you've sinned. All of us, each of us has and invite him by virtue of what he did on the cross for you to become Lord of your life. Because the not having him as Lord of your life is going to have the opposite effect of what Paul is describing as being at peace, saving, looking forward to heaven. So invite him to, uh, to forgive you and to place his, his spirit within you uh, and that's what he does and that uh, you ask him to lead you all the days of your life and if, you do, if you've done that there's a celebration in heaven for you right now you're not going to die isn't that right Paul that's exactly right we're not going to die it, and the death of this world is nothing it's mm. nothing it's nothing it's just nothing and this is a man appointed by the clinicians to die he was expected not to be with us today tell us about your your condition right now paul what is what are you know this is only you know three or four years removed um tell us where you where you stand today we see that you have um an oxygen uh tube uh that you use so you have that going on so where are you today physically so and i have um uh, ongoing lung issues that that will never, uh, as far as the doctors are concerned, will never be fixed. Um, I have emphysema as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on oxygen 24 uh, seven. I can't leave the house without oxygen. Um, it's it's taken me this long just to to get half my strength back. Um, it's been a rough three years. It's been a really, really, really rough three years, but um, I'm here. You're here. I'm, here. I'm alive, I'm happy. I, you know, I could, I could be a very downer person, you know, with all the stuff that I went through and a lot of people are. Um, but I don't want to be that person, and, and God doesn't allow me to be that person. Mm. And I'm very grateful. I'm a very grateful, very grateful Christian right now. I think it's uh, noteworthy to say that, uh, Paul, we had scheduled this um, you know, about a week or so ago, and or a couple of weeks maybe, and you were very ill at that point, so... The Lord uh, graced you with the health to join us uh, today. But I invite our audience to pray for Paul right now. Uh, there are many who are watching right now uh, who are filled with the spirit of the living God, knowing the power they're in. So I invite uh, us as an audience now to pray for Paul, to pray not for his partial recover, but recovery, but his full recovery. All things are possible through Christ who strengthens us. So. Uh, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that, that that golden hand would reach down now and uh, heal those lungs 
would uh, restore health, would allow Paul to breathe freely. Uh, we, we pray that, not just hoping, but knowing that through Christ all things are possible. And we, and we ask you, dear Lord Jesus, to heal our brother Paul so that when we speak with him again, he might have another praise uh, report for us that uh, not only has he been saved from death, but he's been saved from uh, some of the maladies that he experiences uh, today. So that if there's there anything else, Paul, that you would like to share with us before I invite you to pray for our audience. The, the last, the, just the last little tidbit is, um, you know, I, over Thanksgiving this year, I called my pastor back in California. We had two at the church and I spoke to him and he said, did I, did, I, did I tell you about the nurse? I'm like, no. He said, uh, well, some of the nurses that were taking care of you in the ICU, I told them that you're here and you're still doing good. And their words to him were, he's alive. <laughs> so that just goes to show you how far down they, the nurses nobody expected me to be where I'm at today and that's through the grace of God wow wow well that was a testimony I'm sure to them uh, and yeah. maybe they're listening to this maybe you'll be able to we'll let you know uh, to notify them so they can watch watch your interview and see <laughs> how you're doing. I mean, that you are indeed alive, and that's a miracle in and of itself. It's a true miracle in and of itself. I remember, you know, um, I remember talking to some uh, physicians and nurses at that time, and uh, somebody in your condition just doesn't survive. I mean, clinically speaking, you should not be with us today. That's a miracle that you were able to speak with us and that you're with us today. It is 100% a miracle. Yeah. Well, this is uh, maybe my favorite part of our program, and that is I get to invite you, Paul, now to pray for our audience. Would you be so kind as to do so, please? Father, I, I ask in your name that that people hear you and that op they open their heart to you, that they understand that there's more to life than what's in this world. I just, I just really hope and pray that you touch people as you've touched myself and, and that you've touched people around me. And I thank you for all that you've given me all my life back all the people that prayed for me, the power of prayer is, is huge. I, I, I would love for people to understand that as well, that, that Lord, you, you work through people, you work with people, you, you are a voice in people when they don't even know that you're that voice. And Lord, I just, I just pray that you, you, help people in this world to experience what I've experienced throughout my life, but mostly in this last three, four years that I've, I've come to know you in such a different uh, realm, a different aspect. And I just, I just thank you and I'm extremely grateful and I love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, if anyone would like to uh, reach out to Paul, I'm sure he's going to get a lot of interest after this, uh, that you can go to randyk.org on the contact page. But is there any other mention you might like to, uh, to say at this point as well as that? Uh, if there's any way that, I mean, I think my, I'm open to people emailing me or if they want to go on to that and do it that way. However, if there's someone that has a question or needs to hear something beyond what we've covered today, I, I would, I'm very open. I'm okay. Very open. We'll have in the body of this message uh, contact information for Paul. And uh, I'm sure, Paul, that you have touched countless number of lives. I know it. Uh, and I thank you so much for being with us today. 
Thank you, Randy. Thank you very, very much. And I'm super grateful. Well, I am super grateful as well. <laughs> and we have some great news for you. And that is, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, be of good cheer, because heaven is in your future. Take care. All right. God bless. Yes, thank you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.